Chasing the Racing. Powered by Colchester Kawasaki, part of the Global Moto Group. We supply new Aprilla, Moto Guzzi, Vespa, Royal Enfield, Kawasaki, Sim, Mutt and Benelli motorcycles. Three, two, one and welcome back to Chasing the Racing. I am joined on the co-host element with the delicious... Yeah, mysterious. I've said that twice now in two shows. You are you are very mysterious. I love it. The Joe Ackroyd. What you see is what you get, mate. I, I love it. And I tell you what, I'm going to dob you straight in it, Joe. I'm oh, going to let you introduce the guest because he is an ultimate fanboy. He's driven five hours to come down and meet you. He's got a poor severe to sign. I'm, I have. It's uh, pathetic, going, isn't it? It's you're, pathetic. You're going a little, <laughs> <laughs> he's going a little ready. I love it. Yeah, so, like, yeah well, I have, yeah. But I we're joined know. by the one and only John Hopkins. Oh, thank you guys. It's great to be here, and uh, yeah, it's finally, finally good to be uh, on this show, and uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Mate, yeah. No, I, yeah, it is a bit embarrassing, really, but... Uh, a bit. You're, you're going a bit red. I love it, Joyce. It's, fucking, it's the childhood. The childhood, you know, watch, tuning into MotoGP, and you've got your riders, haven't you, when you're 12 or 13 years old, and you're following... I following people and that was you know, yeah you same i had i had the same growing up you know i had my heroes that i just you know ultimately uh you know just was infatuated with and uh and it's a shame though because there's there's some like you know they the the saying you know don't, don't meet, meet your heroes, your heroes and uh I, don't let me down I, <laughs> trust, trust me what you see is what you what you see is what you get with me and uh and and yeah, a few experiences throughout my life uh, of fans that I grew up with and, and people that I obviously very much looked up to um, really let me down in, in person. Uh, really? Even at a young age. Like, I, it was funny. This is actually, we, we'll go straight into the stories, but I had a funny story with this one. I, uh, growing up, we I, I, I was all motocross, so I grew, grew up racing motocross in California, and, uh, and that was, you know, the main thing I did, and... Uh, down in Southern California is kind of the mecca for for Supercross and motocross stars, and they all live down there. And track I used to ride at, uh, Supercross, and you know, top top level motocross riders were always there, riding and practicing on the same days. And uh, one of them that I I you know super he wasn't my favorite, but I I you know really looked up to him. He was like a hero of mine, Ryan Hughes, oh, and right. uh, and he. Uh, he was there one day and uh, he was riding and I was always kind of a little bit shy as a kid and you know I was a little bit reserved in that uh, which I grew out of obviously but most of our people change yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but I uh, I was quite um, you know shy and introvert a little bit and I was always afraid to go up to him but you know all the kids they'd always run up and oh, can I have your jersey can I have your gloves can I have this and that at the end of the day and I always, you know, hung back and, and, you know, it'd be quite easy on that. But uh, one of the days I finally plucked up the courage. I was like, all right, I'm going to go ask him for a jersey. I'm going to go ask. And so I go up and uh, and ask him for a jersey. And I, I don't know if it was just a, it was the day or what the fuck it was. I don't know what the hell was going on, but he was just absolutely just flipped out on me really? pissed off oh you fucking kids well, what is with you kids you always wanted free stuff uh, this and that and like what age were you at this point I was only seven years old at this time like six seven years old and I absolutely just like fell into tears I was like crying I went running back and uh, my dad was a uh, lovely lovely guy and he, he was full British like Cockney accent like he was my born and raised and, and lived in London obviously his whole life uh, and he went up and he just lashed into Hughes like just absolutely what the fuck is wrong with you <laughs> like just really like yeah. laid into him and he was like oh sorry and anyways you know long story like I, I was like super disappointed in that fast forward 20 years right so we go to Anaheim uh, Supercross and I've always gone to Anaheim which is first Supercross of the year I've gone ever since I was four years old five six seven all the way up until I was racing MotoGP obviously it's a specta it's a spectating yeah, right, yeah, yeah, yeah spectating at the Supercross and like you go in you know there's they had the knot hole suite which is like the celebrity suite where you know they get celebrities and you know racers and you know I used to be joined with you know Nicky Hayden Rossi would come and Biaggi and everyone would always come out for the for the first Supercross race and it we makes were it sound like a pub crawl with his local mates yeah yeah, 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 yeah. yeah we just got the fellas went down for a couple of pints you know what I mean yeah. <laughs> and me and Joe were like 
<laughs> and, we, uh, and so, yeah, we're in this suite, and uh, and it's funny. And I, and I had seen Hughes uh, at a few events, like, prior, prior to this, and uh, I never really actually said anything. And finally, like, I was there, and uh, and he was sat right in front of me, and uh, and finally I just plucked up the courage, and I said, you know what? I said, I got to talk to you. I got to say something. Honestly, I don't know if I should be thanking you or upset at you, but you are the reason why I never, ever, like, ever uh, get upset at a fan for wanting a picture, autograph, no matter at what time, what awkward moment, or whatever. Class. But you are the reason why I will always make time for my fans. And he goes, oh, what, what are you talking about? What, what, what do you mean? He didn't remember. And then I told him, and uh, and he was like, and, that, and he was, we be, actually became like quite cool and had loads of like. Because you shit's getting that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> your your but dad's he, not with you, John. Is yeah. He? <laughs> But he, uh, but he, he, he actually did remember it, and he was like, "Oh, I had such a bad day, and I was having a hard time in the championship that year." And I said, "Still, that's no excuse." Yeah, like, not, as not a, a kid, kid, is it? It's, yeah. And uh, and yeah, that was, but that was like the main, like that was a huge point in my life. Like no matter what, I always said from that point forward, like I will always make time for my fans, like. At whatever time, I mean, they're the ones that are. They are the reason why we get to do what we do. You yeah, know, yeah. At the end yeah. of the day, that's uh, that's the ones paying the bills. That's what's you know keeping the entertainment and and you know sponsors happy, and that's why we get paid. It's what makes what it a sport, isn't yeah. it? You know. Did any part of you want to stop racing? You know, when that incident happened at seven, you know what I mean? You thought, well, why do I want to be a bike racer? That must have been really impacting that. Yeah. I, to, to be fair, though, it almost gave me more drive yeah, and yeah. more motivation because I uh, I knew I could be better better than that, a better person than that. And, yeah. and it almost just gave me that more drive and motivation. But, I mean, yeah, it was a letdown in terms of actually, like, whoa, like... But, you know, and then I also met, like, other fans and heroes, like Rick Johnson, who was, like, my ultimate, like, hero at the time. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, bad boy, which is funny. I just watched it. They had a thing with Josh Brooks and... He's got like the bad boy helmet and stuff like that. It was funny, Rick Johnson. I've got poses of me like as a kid at five years old doing like a <laughs> Rick Johnson like gun salute that he used to do a no handed like gun salute. And uh, I've met him multiple times. And it was funny. I just was actually with him this winter and uh, and actually showed him the photo of me at five years old with like my like six or seven trophies that I had behind me like doing like the little like gun <laughs> salute and uh, he loved it but yeah and he was a, a lovely guy super super nice and even when I had, when I met him at a young age he was always super nice and you know it's those people that kept me drived and and you know motivated to obviously you know continue and, and go where I did yeah I'm, I must ask that did you just mention that your dad's from England yeah yeah so all my own <laughs> I am the only person in my family uh, three older sisters uh, my mom, my dad, everyone. I am the only person in my family born in in America. They were all born in 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 UK. Because oh. your your hopper thing that one was on your legs yeah. was half English, yeah. half the Union Jack, and half the yeah. So I'm dual American citizen, flag, wasn't it? Yeah. So yeah. I've got I've got my British passport and my uh, American passport. So and and it's crazy because at this point in my life, I've actually spent more time in the UK now than I living in the in the UK than I have done living in in yeah. the States now. Are you based? over here now then. yeah because yeah. I know so you moved I've, over here for BSB didn't yeah you? and then I've, I've got a house and then my, my well now ex-wife uh, we've got a well had a house in, in Portsmouth which my kids now live in uh, and so yeah I mean I've since I mean even in my Grand Prix career I bought a house up in the Midlands uh, like towards like I don't know, two thousand six, seven, six, six. I I had bought a house and then li spent considerable amount of time, like during the seasons here in the UK throughout. So what? what that that's the all the international, all the Aussies end up in the Midlands, don't they? All end up <coughs> near Mallory Park. Were you, uh, were you anywhere that's near why, Mallory? That's where. That, yeah. Well, I I was I was actually right in between. Uh, I was right in between Donington and Birmingham, actually. Yeah, so yeah. I was I was in Ashby de la Zouch. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, and that and it was that was just the place to be and yeah. you know I had known a lot of people from that area at the time and I was actually my manager he was part of my management company uh, Jamie Dobb the former uh, world motocross like champion he you know and I, I knew him quite well and 
we do quite a bit of motocross, so I, uh, you know, it was I was only a few miles from where he was. Well, what took your parents to America then? Was your dad a pet like a, I was about to say a peddler there, but like a motocross rider, or was he a? He uh, no, or? so he raced uh, when he was a youngster. He he actually raced. Uh, he did the Isle of Man TT uh, He's a proper when bloke. he was young. He's a proper <laughs> bloke. Uh, no wonder no wonder who you are who you are. Proper but, bloke came out so the right he, ball bag. <laughs> <laughs> he raced out of the uh, he raced the uh, the Isle of Man, but he was he was he was too young, and he ended up uh, winning the junior TT one time. But then he he he, he got disqualified because uh, they they he was like two or three years younger than than what he was supposed to be. He lied about his age and. and what then what not, year was that in the sixties? Yeah, 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 like sixties. There were some jealous people there, weren't yeah. there? Like that gun there. Someone pulled up his passport. You know, like yeah. what? You know what I mean? Yeah, like, and he got he got busted for that. And then he had actually just right around that time met my mum, and uh, unfortunately, my mum. Uh, and then they ended up having their first kid, so my mum took him away from racing. Uh, and uh, and. And these so, are your two older sisters. Yeah, 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 yeah. Two older sisters, and well, three. Yeah, three on, in total. <laughs> but uh, so yeah, they ended up. Uh, I don't know. My dad, my mom, my mom's mom ended up moving out to to America first because uh, she had met an American man, and they moved out, and they obviously went and visited, and you know they loved it, and oh. so my mom and dad finally just said, "Let's let's go, let's yeah. you know fuck it, let's go, let's let's make our way out there," and uh, so they did, and uh, and obviously had me. I was their golden ticket, so they, I was their uh, their green card, and and. <laughs> passport out and uh and that was it like what do you my, that was a plot like you know like most kids like grow up in general thinking i'm the mistake he's like no i'm the golden I'm the ticket <laughs> like, you know what I mean? i'm the reason my parents are international <laughs> yeah exactly so who's i, was, who's I, I made the two passport yeah. <laughs> who's your favorite john 100 percent john he's no but if, if you only knew jesus oh like oh no they they i my sisters resented me probably still do i don't but they still do but uh <laughs> Yeah, I mean, obviously being the only boy, but uh, every single weekend from the the time I was born, uh, we were out in the deserts of California. Because, I mean, you've got hundreds and hundreds, thousands of square miles of just deserts that you can ride in just, you know, nobody, nonstop. Nobody gets involved yeah, in, like, exactly. do over here, yeah, like, exactly. walkers and ramblers and people no, on can't ride horses anywhere. and all British that. people. Oh, just just British horrendous, people. isn't it? <laughs> So Just yeah, they uh, we were every single weekend we were camping at the uh, the deserts in California and, and riding you know motocross bikes and so forth. So uh, I mean I, I first started riding when I was two years old, um, and then uh, and then that was it. Just just growing up like just started riding nonstop, and then we went and visited. Uh, we went and watched a family friend, uh, my dad's friend that. Uh, that was racing at a local like track in Los Angeles called Ascot at the time, no longer there sadly. But uh, yeah, they, I ended up watching the uh, the kids go out on the little PW fifties instantly. Like told my parents like well, why can't I do that? And so instantly my dad actually went to a, a junkyard. So he, he ended up because I mean my my dad was a lorry driver and and my mom was secretary. So I mean we didn't have much money, but uh, we ended up going to a uh, junkyard and building my my first 50 from a complete junkyard they ended up was ended up being like some form of like a honda little mini trail and uh, we pulled it out went to our first place pulled it out and everyone even the security guards laughed at us like they were like oh come on you're not racing that thing are you <laughs> and uh and we're like yeah i didn't know i'm any different i was fucking buzzing i was like yeah i'm ready to race and <laughs> Anyways, you got out the car with your helmet on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> What's your problem? I was in jeans and like I uh, didn't even have a jersey or anything at the time, and uh, they got a helmet for me. And anyways, we uh, I ended up getting eighth out of like 24, 24 riders, and uh, and that was it. My 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 dad came up with the plan. He's like, all right, we got to go see because my my nan was the one with the, the money saved up, my grandma. So uh, we went to grandma that week. Is that, is that your mother's side or your father's yeah, yeah, side? Yeah, 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 yeah. It was my, my mother's side. Oh, there you go. Uh, you guaranteed a yeah, ticket yeah. at that point. Make so me we, little boy. We went to come, grandma. Come me there, get you looking all smart. Right, go ask grandma for the money for the bike. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And that's exactly what we did. Do we that little smile, grandma. John. And so, so what we did is actually invited her to the next week's race. Yeah. Rode the same bike. Following week, you know, 
Grandma came out. I ended up doing a little bit better as well, like sixth, seventh, or something. It was like contract that. time. Yeah, it was exactly. contract time. <laughs> and that was it, man. We can't have him riding that bike. We need to get. Why can't you get? Oh, what? And then boom, we were at the Yamaha dealership the next week Perfect. buying a brand new PW50. And <laughs> just imagine how different your life would have been if your nan went. This is too quick. You know, if she actually yeah. went, you know what I mean? Imagine if she yeah. went, oh, you know, I'm not a fan of this. Yeah, you know what I mean? You know, exactly. like, you know, get that boy a tennis racket or something. You, know, you, you say know, that. Yeah. You know what I mean? By the sounds of it, if that had been the case, your dad would have found another No, ride. they would have found, it, no, it, my dad, he was, it, he it, was, it, uh, he knew, he knew how to, to make things work. Yeah, he, he would have found a way somehow. Like, he was always like, yeah. your dad was going to be your You yeah. know, your dad's <laughs> committed. You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> but literally from that point, like, my family's money, their time, their life, everything basically revolved around my racing from from literally that point forward. And obviously, uh, you know, within that year, we were already traveling, you know, to to Florida, uh, Punk City, Oklahoma, like the, the big American nationals, literally like, you know, you think, you know, it's funny, you get here in the UK, oh, you know, we're going to drive up to Knock Hill, such a long drive, oh, you know, like six, seven, eight hours, whatever. And, you know, we're talking seven, eight days of driving to get to, sure, to some of those, like, I mean, like, non-stop days of, yeah. like, and it's... Uh, On yeah, a map, lot, it doesn't look that far, does it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. but I Maybe mean, yeah, it's <laughs> like, you're talking, like, 50, 60 plus hours of driving, like, like, uh, to get to some of those and and we were doing them like three four cross country trips uh a year like uh Holy doing shit. all the the motocross nationals in our old like beat up like ford van that we had our action van i used to call it action van. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for a different reason i'm yeah, sorry exactly. <laughs> that was later when, later when, in life yeah, it was action when, when john hit puberty it changed <laughs> yeah exactly quickly was, changed. was your dad ever the motocross dad Yes. Not, no, no. Or, so or were you always given my a... dad? So that I, you know, I had so many experiences with this, like, and and that's another one, like that. Uh, that even now working with younger riders, and you know, we've got an academy over in America that I'm working with a lot of younger riders. That was the biggest teaching lesson of my life, like growing up around all those different motocross kids. So it was a kid that I you uh, I grew up racing with, and this kid was just unbelievable fast, like. He was the one kid that I I literally just couldn't beat. Like I rarely ever beat this kid, and uh, and he was fast everywhere, and uh, and he was just always on it. And uh, the dad was just like always on top of him. Oh, you little pussy! Like super, super crazy Savage. stuff. Yeah, at, like yeah. uh, at a very young age, and. Uh, Anyways, I ended up beating the kid in, we, in motocross, you have the two motos, and I ended up beating the kid in the first moto, and the dad was absolutely laying in, you little pussy, you're going to let him beat you again on the start line for the, for the second race, and the kid literally got off of his bike, kicked it over on the start line, literally kicked it over, walked off. That was it. Never saw the kid at a, at a motocross yeah. race the rest of my life. And, like, all that talent was gone. Like, every, I, I, I mean, this kid was, like, <clears throat> crazy talent. And I hate it. it. I hate never, when you see You don't see it as much in road racing, do you? I think yeah, that's why the saying no. is what the motocross yeah. dad's saying. But whenever I see it, I, it's hard not to almost want to... There's a part of me that wants to go over and grab the dad. Yeah. Well, my feed dad, him, my dad punched... Myself, my, yeah. dad punched a, my dad yeah. punched a, a rival's... Uh, uh, the dad. Yeah, the, the dad. Rival dad yeah. The rival's dad for laying into Speaking his own kid. kid. Like shit, yeah, yeah like, I mean, like bad. Like slapped him upside the head yeah. and was like laying into him. And my dad actually fucking went and, and punched yeah, him and decked man. him. Good and man. Uh, and and really like. And my dad was like known as, you know, he always was nicest guy ever. Me, he was always working on everyone else's bikes. Always like yeah. mechanicing for everyone else, making sure everyone else made it. Even like you know all my my rivals and so forth and uh i was lucky at a young age like because uh the only time the only time i ever got in trouble or i ever got yelled at was uh was when coming off of a race i uh, i was super pissed off i mean obviously because i'd gotten beaten I, I wasn't riding well and uh i ended up being beaten by like a guy i knew i shouldn't have been beat by 
and uh, I came off the track. I was super fucking pissed off. I came off and I ghost rode my bike into a just tree. Just jumped off the back like, of it. I just jumped off the back of it and ghost rode it into a tree, and I was like super pissed off. That was it. My dad came storming over. Literally, I'd never seen him so mad in my life. Weird Literally weird. came up, picked up the bike, took everything through. And this was at the first moto as well. And so, you know, we still had the second moto to go. He came over, picked the bike up, threw it in the van. Literally just threw all the shit and said, right, you're done. No more. Threw it in the van. I was like crying. We ended up going home that day. And like I was still in like the championship fight, but we went home. That's like, a man of morals, goes, that man of morals, man of principles, yeah. Like, yeah. And that was yeah. the biggest like learning lesson and teaching moment in my life. Like from that moment forward, I was like, all right, you know, I need to. Like, what age were you there? Uh, that was about like eight or nine, yeah, like eight, eight or, or nine. nine, yeah. So you've had, so, you know, you've had the life change moment with like you know, with yeah, seven year olds, exactly. you know, kind of jersey, and then. Yeah, no, those are, I mean, those are the, the moments, obviously, as a kid that, that shape you. At what point, even that, you know, it's mad, we haven't even, like, we've gone from 7 to 40 <laughs> at the moment. No, 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 but, like, you know, you're ghost riding bikes, you know, you, you've already got your natural, like, competitive nature, shall yeah. I say. You know, you know you want to do well. But can you remember that definitive point of going, I want to win everything? When did that start for you? You know what I mean? Like that that was it was in my blood. It was in my DNA like from the the second I was born. Everything from anything from my sisters to my friends or whether it was BMX in, whether it was surfing, whether it was snowboarding, whether it was like anything. I always had to be the best. Like, You're and, that kid at, the, at like, sports day that is going to just put you in the fucking I fence to win. <laughs> picked up everything like super quick and I was I just yeah. had that natural ability to to really pick things up quick. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, apart from team sports, like, and it was crazy. My family made me, they actually forced me to do like all the school sports and the, you know, American football and the baseball and the, and the all, and I'd never got through fucking a week of, of like making the team or, or doing, and I would sometimes pick it up, but then I'd be like, nope, I want to go back to motorcycles. I want to yeah. do this. And, yeah. and. But it was always in my blood to win and like everything like that. But uh, yeah, it was uh, it was funny because it was at a national race. Like it was at a because my fam, my dad was always road racer, and obviously, like you know, it's just not that it wasn't that big over there. So and we only knew motocross, and that's all I knew at a young age. And then we ended up going to a, a really big national motocross the biggest in america was mm. the punk city and uh i was racing that but uh, at the same time there was a go-kart track a, a go-kart track on the facility Aye. and the go-kart track was actually hosting uh the american championship for mini road racing and so what they did is they ended up having like a little exhibition obviously trying to get more motocross Kids Lads in all right. So what, they did an exhibition. What were they riding? What were they uh, classes? YSR fifty. So right. they like back. Those were the little mini road race. They yeah, were like yeah. the Ovales of nowadays. All right, like, Sam. That, that was what I was thinking. I was thinking what what were little they using Yamaha now? YSR fifties, yeah. and yeah. Uh, they were having their national championship on the karting track at the same weekend, and so. Anyways, they had the exhibition and they said, oh, you know, like any like 50s and 60s can come over and, and ride it and so forth. And uh, they were going to do like an open class to event. And so my dad saw and he was like, yeah, like, yeah, we'll go and That's do it. That's a bit of him really, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. So he's like, oh, you should, you know, just try it. See if you like it and stuff like that. And so I rode it and I ended up having knobby tires like from the motocross track. So I had my knobby <laughs> tires and I was going up against kids that were on PW 50s and 60s that were uh, family or, or, you know, something of like they had older brothers or whatever, like racing in the in the, the road race, the yeah. mini road race, but they were on dirt track tires, which were far more suitable to, to the, the, you know, road cart circuit. I see. Oh, because like flat track tires. Like, yeah. Like they had round tires. Yeah, and you yeah had so yeah, they had round the tires tire, with groove, yeah. but it was far more... You know, they were far better and far more grip than what... <laughs> they actually have a radius yeah. on them, don't they? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, the There's some, safe. like, radius. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, and still, though, I ended up every single... I raced the 50, modified 50, and the 60cc class. And uh, and then, in I think it was every class... Uh, I think it was in every class, uh, I lapped up to second place. 
uh, I just, I don't know why, I just took to it. Like, really, like, well, I was in my motocross gear as well. Like, you see a lot of motocrossers do that. Yeah, so, I think it's far easier to transition from motocross to yeah, road racing definitely. than it is road racing to motocross, yeah, isn't it? You see a, a lot of that. I'll tell you what, that's a very good question because you've never, I've never seen that. No, like a road racer going, you know what, I'll have a crack at motocross. You, well, they're all one... into the flat track yeah. now, aren't they? And they're, they're getting used to that, but it's not motocross. No, because motocross is, motocross is so much, it's it's basically like, it's the same thing as like motorcycles to cars. Yeah. Like you you can always get a motorcycle racer that can go and race cars. Yeah, yeah. But you'll never get the motor, uh, car driver to go race professional yeah, motorcycle yeah. racing because there's so much technique involved yeah. uh, when riding a motorcycle. And then that's even doubled again with the motocross because the bikes and technique that yeah, it takes yeah. to ride a motocross bike. I mean, you almost have to like, you always have to predict and know and, and have that almost just natural instinctive feeling of what the bike's gonna yeah, do. Yeah. And that's something that's heightened in motocross even more so than, than road racing. Yeah. And uh, so I think it's that's why it's only far easier to for them to transition over. And when you're seven, eight years old, you're even more sort of with, you've yeah. removed the fear factor, haven't you? Because you're not yeah, scared of that. Exactly. Age. You just, and yeah. then it just yeah, it was it was just something I instantly took to, and it was funny because there was in funny enough, I was actually racing uh, Roger Hayden because uh, the Hayden brothers were actually there at the mini road race. So Nicky Hayden was on a YSR 50 uh, riding at the time with his older brother, Tommy Hayden. Yeah. And then Roger Lee Hayden, the younger brother, was was in my class on the 50s on the dirt track tires. Who's nearest to uh, you in age then? Roger. Because Nicky was always like two years older than I was. Yeah. Um, and so uh, Roger was actually in the class that I was racing in on like the dirt track tires. And I'm going to ask and, the question that everyone's going to ask. <laughs> Did you beat him? <laughs> yeah, of course. I, I, I actually lapped him. So, yeah, a lot of people wow. listen to this podcast so, yeah. now going, let's just look through these uh, <laughs> look through his yeah. history. Yet. <laughs> no, no. So I actually did lap him, but it was funny. So, you know, my dad was always a talkative guy. He always like, you know, loved chatting to people. And, and instantly, like loads of people came up to my dad and was like, what the hell's going Like, where the hell does this kid come from? Like, what we, we need to get him on one of our bikes. Like, and then, so they, they ended up meeting quite a few people from Southern California over there at the event. Right. And, uh, and they were like, hey, like, we, we've got to get him on our bike. And, and so that was it. Like, literally, like, the following, you know, week or two weeks, once they finally made the drive back, uh, I ended up testing a little YSR 50 for the first time and ended up being in the wet the first time I rode it uh, at a local track, local kart track. In Southern California and uh, and that was it and I just started doing I any off weekend I had from motocross I'd spend it YSR racing I was gonna and say then, to you was that you it for the end of motocross it, then or yeah, was that no it was it was was it the beginning of the end it was the beginning of the end but I stuck with motocross uh, and then it, it kind of just started to transform as the bike started to get bigger and I got onto the 80 cc uh, mini road race bikes i started to actually enjoy that a little bit more and then it was a little bit more complicated because my dad actually passed away when i was 12 years old never uh yeah and so, so, what, he, so sorry what age was this you know this moment on the tarmac what age were you uh so it it was nine years old right was the first was the eight nine like eight, jumping off onto the old. nobblies onto the tarmac yeah and that was like eight nine years old eight eight years old when i did that on the yeah. tarmac and then nine years old when i first started racing the ysr and uh that, 50. and you carried on with the motocross alongside and just still with that, motocross was still like my main focus and and it was all the way up until i rode uh an rs 125 for the first time so like I literally wrote, and it was cool because my dad actually got to witness it because he, he was quite ill with lung cancer at the time That's and I was only yeah. 12 years old. So he actually came to my first test of riding the RS-125 and uh, it was at a, like a quite a, it was a large uh, go-kart track, but like more of a car track, but it was, they called it Streets of Willow and uh, yeah, it was still like pretty sick flat out on a, on a, up the front straightaway on a RS-125 and uh, and it was crazy. That was the moment that I literally like, uh, I literally transformed and, and my kind of- The motocross bikes went, went in the garage. Yeah, yeah. They, it went strictly, yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, 
it's funny i even put it in my in my book but i i literally the first time i went up the front straightaway i mean obviously at that age you know 12 years old i was you know early puberty but i literally got a bone <laughs> <laughs> I, I literally did going up the front straightaway the most memorable boner in your life yeah, <laughs> what, what page is that what page is that well there's a full air page 130 <laughs> So I literally got so excited, like it even like it turned me on in a way. I don't know, but it it was uh, it oh, was funny. Awesome. But I literally that was it. Like I was like, oh, I love this. Like, and uh, and then my my, you know, my kind of focus went a lot more into the road racing over those next like few years. Even though I still gained you know, kept up with the motocross and doing everything. My family did everything they could to keep me motocrossing and, and doing everything. My mom and my sister, uh, the next oldest sister to me, because she, she was like my personal mechanic. What was your, what was your, what was their drive to that? If you know, because you lost your dad at 12, God love you. Yeah. You know, that, that's a, no, that, that, no family should go through that no, period. That's but massive, it was, you know, to keep was, that going. Yeah, my, I mean, my mum was, was a saint, and she, I mean, she knew, obviously, the talent and everything. You know, I'd already accumulated, mul like, multiple, multiple championships by this point, and, uh, you know, I, it, you could tell I was, I already had quite a few sponsors and people mm. that were helping me out, and, uh, you know, my they obviously saw the talent in, in what I had and, and how much I loved it. Um, and uh, yeah, like I said, my mom just did everything, everything she could to, to keep me in it and keep me kind of focused into it. And what, I... Because I was going to say, I, I've read your book. Cause yeah. Chris, he had, had rung me after, he'd listened to it. He used to love his audio books, yeah. didn't he? And he, uh, he rung me after listening to it and he says, you've got to get Hopper's book, get Hopper's book. So I'm not very good at reading. I'm a bit steady. Uh, trust reading, me, I haven't, so. even, I haven't so. read the book myself yet. <laughs> so I got, I got the book, read it in about three days. My missus was amazed that I was reading because I just don't read anything. Yeah. I'm just terrible at it. So obviously, I'm, and a lot of the listeners and or viewers are going to have done exactly the same. So we know kind of what's gone on the time. Like I'm a little bit fuzzy on it, but one thing that comes out in your book is like how amazing your mum was and she passed away a couple of years ago didn't she yeah sadly. yeah and, sadly. Um, you're not sorry about that no you know? thank and, you uh, yeah or the right the way through the book you know you, everything goes back to your mum done it and she yeah. sounds like one hell of a woman because yeah. when your dad passed away she just she kept she kept going didn't she amazing. yeah no she kept amazing. in it and she uh she did everything she started you know she was working two jobs and uh and did everything just to 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 keep me into the racing and it was funny i because she pulled my dad out of racing obviously like when when they had their first kid and she was like it's too dangerous roy uh you know and i believe it was because of that she never once like took me away she did wow. everything she possibly could and more to to keep me into racing <laughs> some woman uh and i mean i you know i'd already by this point had broken you know four five six bones you know at least and casts and you know the, god knows how many like stitches and and you're a parent now like, so you know what yeah, that's like yeah, exactly. when your little ones get hurt no and, exactly yeah. no i oh it terrifies me i hate it like see, see, I've seeing talked, them i've talked about it before that my little girl had, had crashed a little electric throttle mm -hmm. bike and she had a big one and smashed all her face up and that was the first time that same thing where you kind of have a moment don't you as a parent you go mm. ah now I, now i get what i've been putting them through yeah all those years you don't get it until you're a parent yeah you? exactly you don't get it. yeah no it's it's heartbreaking like you just you want to protect them and do everything you can to see them not ever get hurt so yeah. you know to see him putting himself through that or into that like it's uh yeah it is scary it is contradictory and, and, <laughs> yeah but uh i believe the whole reason why she never did anything to to hold me back from it and only promoted me and motivated me and and kept me going was uh was because she did feel bad i think because my dad obviously was talented and you know probably could have gone quite far in his life in motorcycle racing so i think that's the reason why she was so you know determined and not obviously that you know the amount i loved it and how much you know she she wanted me to succeed but uh you know it was uh it was no my mom was was super super amazing her and and my my next oldest sister they they you know did everything and then yeah it was at 15 where i either had the option to either go like i had an option at that point to either go uh pro motocross with team green which was like a 
it's kind of like an academy so it wasn't it's like an internship almost they provide mm -hmm. the bikes and you know sometimes the the travel and they can get you to the races and so forth just that but a little bit of structure that yeah you need, a little yeah. bit of structure and under a team kind of umbrella but that lasts for you know another year or two or blah 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 and like you know the amount of kids that grow up wanting to be a supercross rider in america i mean there's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of them you know across america so big over there isn't and, it? Oh, yeah, and massive. it's and the finite amount that ever actually make it yeah. is is you know quite small uh, obviously and uh and so you know whereas in road racing it just came easy to me uh you know i i was one of only like four kids around america that were at my level at that time never yeah, it was only yeah, it was me, uh, Nikki Hayden, Ben Spees, and uh, any more then, legends you like that? Than that you know what I mean? It's just like, you know, and then and yeah, and that that was just that was all that there really was at the time, and so I had the option, to, and then I also had like a forty grand. I, they were offered me like forty thousand dollar contract. Uh, hmm. to go with the, Suzuki I'll, yeah I wonder what the persuading aspect <laughs> so of that was at 15, you know, like, at 15 I was like ah oh, you know I'll, yeah well, I'll take that but I mean it, it was also a good moment for me because I obviously had to grow up at a really young age like obviously losing my dad you know I had to obviously and I knew what my mom was putting into to my racing and everything that they had done you know over the years and did you it, know it you, was did you ever have a moment where you thought actually from your perspective, it must have crossed your mind that you thought, I'm actually going to knock this on the head. Or was that not a case for you? No, no. That's, that's no, a very, you no, know, thinking, I'm not going to put I, the family through that. I'm not going to, you know, I'm, I'm not going to put them any more stress. You know, we've had with fun, but it's, it's, you had a boner on an Aris one Mate, too. Oh, he wasn't thinking about anything <laughs> else about getting another one of those. That's why I'm asking the question, because you know what I mean? That's a huge, no, no one in this world, and unfortunately, people do you know losing losing a family member is massive yeah and especially just... my dad like that was a that was a tough one like so i did i did i went through a a, yeah. a really like uh rebellious stage like I, it and i don't think i grieved him properly like i mm. just put it to the back of my mind and um racing was like my only kind of getaway that was like my release was yeah, yeah. was racing and being on a motorcycle was like my only release but uh i did i was very rebellious growing up like i always had a uh and it's and it's like, oh, the exact same gene is in my my uh, my eldest daughter right now which push, push like, him back everything, on everything yeah pushing back on everything yeah. and very manipulative i always had my mom and and my dad wrapped around my finger and like it's just crazy how much my eldest daughter is like exactly the same but uh how old is she she's nine now oh. and uh oh you haven't and, even gotten the teens yet no. yeah <laughs> exactly but i was yeah i i was a i was a rebellious kid like and i was always i i wanted to do the wrong thing you know yeah do you think that that was the start of the legend <laughs> yeah well, you know, 100%, you know and all the stories like, and the 100 percent. like that, that was the I, beginning I, 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 you know, obviously always got a kick at doing the naughty thing, and you know, I always went the the other way than what was supposed to be the right way, and uh, and like I said, I I I was always quite rebellious, uh, and then obviously losing my dad made I went through a, a very those early teen years when you know he would have slapped me into line, you know there was no one, and I like I said I was very manipulative, so I always had my mom wrapped around my finger so I could get myself into you know a heap of trouble and and always managed to to you know get away with it with my mom cheeky and, smile and, flutter your eyelids and yeah, carry on. yeah and I could I could get away with like a little bit of a hand slap and you know and it was yeah it wasn't I look back on it now and I you know I I feel bad about it obviously for a lot of things you know I I had done and manipulated and you know stuff where I I put her through a tough time as well like mm. with the friends I was hanging out with and the bad things I'd get up to and stuff like that well, no, like what I'm like what I find very curious is like you know we we're talking about your, your passion was always going to drive you down that route you know mm. you were you weren't going to pack it in obviously your, your dad was such a strong point but it, you're definitely not the character that's fear like fearful of failure but did that cross your mind? Like, it's a bit like, we're going to carry on the story. We're going to keep going down the race and we're going to keep this going. Did it cross your mind at any point going, what happens if this doesn't work? 
To be fair, I never. To be fair, though, it never, never crossed. I no. like from from the literally the first time I raced a motorcycle at four or five years old. There was never any any doubt in my mind that I was going to be a that I wasn't going to be a professional motorcycle racer and. Like there, I, and I can honestly and seriously say that. Like there was never a moment in my life that I didn't say from from four or five years old that I wasn't going to be a professional yeah. motorcycle racer. Like it, even at the career days and the the family, like you know the, the school like education. And I had a lot of teachers growing up that like said like really like were were horrible and like oh you're never going to be anything. You know, and I, because I had to miss quite a bit of school with all the traveling that we yeah. did, like throughout my whole childhood. And I had some horrible teachers that, like, I wish I. You got wish... any names of them? Yeah. Look down yeah. the lens. <laughs> yeah. Mrs. Miggett, your bitch. Yeah, Mrs. Wills, my sixth grade teacher, was the biggest bitch. I hope you're watching. The entire... I hope you're watching. And I, I actually went back to that school and I tried to find her, but she had moved to <laughs> fucking bum fuck. Like, and it was when I was like making, you know, whatever four or five million a year and you know it was like pull up in, and, pull up in a Porsche yeah, and just give and it I the was bird on my, yeah, yeah. and you know I was at the height of my you know Suzuki GP career and I wanted to go and find her and be like yeah motorcycles weren't going to get me anywhere were they yeah fuck and, you uh, there's a hundred grand get yeah, some manners <laughs> but she obviously had moved and it was funny because I went from the year before having the, the best teacher in my life who was so amazingly supportive of, of me and my motorcycle and what I wanted and because she knew and saw the passion and, and everything that I was putting into my racing and how passionate I was about it. And she completely was like supportive and like and and, you know, was was massively supportive in helping me like with that goal and that vision and always follow your dream and this and that to like you're never gonna make anything motorcycles are nothing like you need to get and it was right at the time that like i obviously it was the same year i lost my dad and i just oh, said yeah. fuck it like i from that point forward because i was always like a, a you know we, we with our grade system in america a's and b's and i was always like a like a a straight a b oh, like at the height of my, I was always like a, a really Cle good, oh, yeah, clever, yeah. little, clever little shit. Yeah, then, you know yeah, I mean? yeah, well, somewhat. But I, <laughs> I always did really well in school in all my primary years, like super, super good in school. And it was some that exact. I went fucking. I just literally did the bare minimum from that point forward, and just said, you know what, fuck, I don't need this. Like, yeah, fucking, yeah. and uh, and it it was it was from that point that I literally did the absolute bare minimum in in school from that point and put even more focus into my racing do you guys you, am i right in thinking you have to you like graduate high school don't you in america yeah. so did yeah. you graduate or did no you know, I, did you it was bothered with my it? mom actually she got you know, i feel bad for my mom about this but i did because uh, i ended up uh, obviously leaving school uh like three years uh before obviously you're meant to but is i went six, i did six is it 16 you leave school in america she's a bit older in it yeah, 18. 18. yeah, yeah. Oh, so, so you you're supposed it. to do mandatory school until 18 in right. america and that's then you your senior year yeah. yeah, and then, but, you... uh, but I left school at, at 16. I did homeschool, even though it was like, I literally just wrote words on a page, and then I, you know, every couple of weeks I'd have to go in to grade my own work, and so I'd give myself like a, hey. you know, just enough, <laughs> like, no, I'd give, no, I, I, I was a bit smarter. I, I, I do like the B, C, like just enough so they wouldn't get suspicious. Yeah, Did yeah. you ever give yourself any it, like, like dodgy, like, creditations, like, that guy must try hard at, nah, nah let's, let him make it stronger. Yeah. <laughs> Pay attention in class, that'll get me out the woods a little bit, there you go. <laughs> but I'd literally do just enough where I, like, wouldn't get, get caught, but, uh, but I, I literally was like, I don't know, two or three credits because you have to go on amount of credits to, and I, when I was 18. And I, I stopped entirely just to make a point. Like I didn't want to actually graduate from high school because I, it, like I said, from that teacher, I, and I learned more traveling with my dad and traveling with my family, like cross country and maths and you know mileage and everything. I learned more in the van with my family they and, used to do like songs as you're driving and, yeah, yeah, were, they, yeah. were they actively teaching you as yeah, well yeah exactly yeah and they were always like good I've with all the sisters as good as well into yeah. it because got they're trying to work with you the whole time as well yeah, yeah. exactly and I learned more always and, and traveling and cultures and you know different because 
you know, America's so big, you go cross country, it's like you're living, it's like you're in a different country when you go back east or south and all of that and experience all the different cultures and things and, uh, and places and like all the like cool shit we'd go to and see in between. And I learned more doing that. So I just said, screw it. Like I'm, I don't, I, I'm not even going to graduate. Like I, I see no, and it was crazy. Cause I like throughout my life, I ended up like having a bunch of friends, obviously that went the school route and doing that. And I had all kinds of friends that did the whole four years of university and everything, getting the degree and the bachelor's degree and all of that, that 80% of them did four years of, you know, did the whole high school, got four years, university, bachelor degree, and then never ended up using their degree in their profession. They ended up going and selling motorcycles because they could sell motorcycles and make more money. And yet they're living hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt yeah. from university and so forth. And I'm, you know, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but it wasn't my route. And it yeah, wasn't yeah, that's like it, it that's just, it. and it was more of a statement that I figured, you know, I, I just, so I just so I packed it in and didn't. I only was like two credits away, and, I, and my mom was quite upset about that. But I, mom was always upset was about like, the education well, thing, so, aren't they? Yeah. Mom's, yeah. And I just made it. I just told her. I said no. Like that. Uh, from that sixth grade teacher, that made me not want to actually graduate. I just I didn't see any relevance to to doing it. And so and and you know I'm very fortunate and blessed to to be able to to have made motorcycle race in my life and had the career that I had too. Also make a life in motorcycle racing even after my career but yeah. uh yeah but it's, it's, I, I want to go back to 16 year old john yeah so you've left you know what i mean before I, I want out like where were you you know if, like we you were still at home yeah you know with your mom and everything like that yeah so was it a case of were you getting enough sponsors to fund yourself you know were you thinking just keep working at them like you literally did no, school no. what was the plan after you went i'm, I'm not here anymore no, but they me. signed. I got a from Suzuki and and a guy that I was the team owner that I that I grew up kind of racing his son and I I built up a good relationship with him. Yeah. Uh, he was own. He's still owner of the M4 Suzuki team, like the the Suzuki team that's in America now. Um, but he uh, John Ulrich, he, he's the editor of Road Racing World magazine over there. Um, but he. Uh, he had, like I said, offered me the forty thousand dollar contract to at go and six, race with him. At sixteen, you were yeah. earning forty grand a year. Yeah, and that was just I would have, I would have gone out of school. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even done the paperwork <laughs> element. Be like forty grand, son, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that go. that was my I, that was it. I went directly to to road racing and uh, and took that route. Man. And uh, how many people? I, I ended up getting into a bit of a I can pickle that that year though because. Uh, I, I ended up winning the championship, ended up having like an amazing year and it was super, I won like, Jesus, I don't know, I think it was like, like 40, like 50 grand in bonuses. But um, I ended up, the minute I signed my contract, I bought, I bought my mom a, a Ford Mustang, which a, she always wanted. So that was, that was the first thing I did was bought my mom a Ford Mustang, bought myself a, a big fuck off, like a uh, Ford F-150 like pickup truck, which yeah. I didn't even have my license yet. I was about to say, what age you I, had, I always had, I was I was fit, like 15 going on 16, so I didn't, <laughs> even have, the <laughs> didn't even have my license yet. But I had an I older mate. I bet he didn't just stay on the drive, did he? I had an older mate that had his license, yeah. who was like kind of, he had a, a bad childhood and, and he was actually living with me at the time. And, uh, and so he drove me around and chauffeured me around in my in own, own, in my own really truck. Have. And, uh, so yeah, we drove that around all year, and then you know my mom, not really like knowing herself, but uh, she assumed because I was under the age eighteen that I wasn't going to have to pay taxes that year. Oh, and shit. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, at the end of the year, like you know, I obviously bought my truck and motocross bikes and you know yeah, did a yeah, bunch yeah. of you know dumb shit that you do at that age and. Uh, Fuck. And, and then so the tax man turned, tax up. Man turned uh, up and says basically, like in America, then in California, it's basically 48% tax. Shut up, man. And so, 48. Yeah, I want half your wages. Give us 30, 20 grand. Yeah. So and the rest. 30, 38%, 38% federal and then 10% for California. On your bonuses as yeah, well. Yeah, uh, everything. So it was 100K everything, that any year, income and you had 50 possible. Grand you had to pay. Yeah. And so they came and said so, basically, yeah, we need 50 bastards. grand. I was like, and. And I was like, well, I, and my mom, unfortunately, you know, she didn't have 50 grand saved up that she could just give me. So 
by the time I ended up paying that off, fucking four or five years down the road, I ended up paying over a hundred and twenty thousand dollars just in penalties. Like by the time I paid off that tax. To be fair, they'd do the same to you, wouldn't they? If you if they turned up and you earned it yeah. in the UK, they'd say to you, "Well, no, you know, you're not setting up a and payment plan." Yeah, no, the know, IRS and in and they're nothing to fuck with. They're super bad and uh, death and taxes, young the two things. Yeah, they're, they're. I mean, they've put literally career life criminals away that not even the FBI or law enforcement couldn't like. You know, like there's a few of them, like Al Capone and others that. The federal government couldn't lock them away, but the IRS, the IRS got them. And that's but, who turned and, up at your door uh, <laughs> when you were sixteen. Yeah, saying, and they turned up <laughs> and they were they, you know. So I, uh, it was a big issue though, because that ended up because of that, I've been aud- audited like six, seven times, like throughout my entire life. They now. just continuous and, because of that one. Yeah, because, because of you that get a black one. Mark by yeah, and yeah. so loads of the american uh writers like because i mean no one kind of really you know you get all the the european writers and the australian writers all of them lived in like the tax-free countries you know, switzerland, the Island Man, the switzerland <laughs> and and andorra and everything and like i had so many australian teammates that all lived in in uh you know all these tax-free countries and like they'd always be pissed because i always made more money than whatever teammate i had at the time like i always had an actual higher you know number basic contract which they'd always give me shit about oh well you're making this or like you know because i'd always be quite cool with my teammates and like but when we talk about it and they'd be oh you're fucking making more than me and this and that but at the end of it they were making way more than what I was because every year I was always putting away 50% for taxes. So like... That's just massive. That's yeah, steep in it as well. That. Yeah. And That's I steep. couldn't screw around whereas all the other American writers, you know, they always would put, you know, a, a few hundred thousand away in like a Swiss I've account. Never, I've something. never earned a hundred grand. <laughs> <away. I've> never, <laughs> yeah, never, never, nice position know. to be in, isn't it? Well, and they would, a few hundred thousand away. Yeah. And they would always <laughs> like a few <laughs> yes. away and, and be able to kind of easily get away with it. But you know when they when yeah the amount of times i was audited it was just never because if i would have got caught with that it would have been over with so what well, like that must have taken the shine off the, you know what i mean you bought your mama mustang you know thank you very much for everything you know you bought yourself a truck you know what i mean i'm i'm 16 with a truck like uh, that at what age did you lose your virginity 15 in my ford f-150 because i was 15 I signed the deal when I was. Yeah, it was is in, that in my, the book. Yeah, yeah. Is, yeah. the way you did react, I think that's in the book. That so that I is. lost. I lost it. Yeah. We when were, you've read the book, it could tell you anything, and you you just sit there and go, "Yeah, I'd, I, nothing would surprise you," because it's yeah. next level. It's uh, if, so, no, yeah, if you haven't read it. it, you need to read it. Yeah. <laughs> so I lost my Virginia in that in that truck, yeah, parked out in front of my mate's house, like at, at yeah. I, I was I was I was like fifteen, going on six, like I or I just turned sixteen. Do you, know, yeah. do you know? Do you know? How old were you when you smoked your first cigarette that night? Please tell me it's that night. No, it was. It was, it was just prior to that, fifteen. So like, it was fifteen. Like I, I started smoking when I was. That was, well, a couple of them. I smoked weed and cigarettes for yeah. the first time at fifteen, and uh, and obviously fell in love with both at that age. And uh, and so yeah, it was. That is, that. Mate, that is the coolest 15 year old who's ever crossed the planet. <laughs> Imagine some bloke who's a plumber, you know what I mean, going in his scrapped out van there, John Hopkins in his brand new truck, got the woman on his arm and yeah. like, smoking ganja like that. Guy. Ah, it's, a, it's tough being me. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, I used to, and then that was it. Like, I literally, from from the, you know, from the first one, I mean, I was, I was. I, you know, it, it was just a thing to do in Southern California when you're a young, you know, teenager in Southern California, especially into like the snowboarding and surfing and motocross yeah, yeah. and everything that I was like, it was just a thing you did. You smoked weed all day, every day. So, and I, I did like, I mean, except when I went riding, I was riding, I'd go and ride all day and, and then come home and then I'd smoke weed with my buddies and mates and head out, you know, and all of that and uh i never mixed the two though like i never i never actually you know i would i would party you know hard and all the drinking and smoking weed and all that and like obviously experimented with the drugs and all that yeah. throughout my young teenage life but when i went away to the races and flew to the races i was you know 100 percent. you know like would stay sober until 
you know, Saturday night, and then at six, I'd always have because you can't drink it in America until you're 21. 21. So, yeah, yeah, that's the thing. You know what I mean? It's we and it was good because I grew up racing like in the super sport, like uh, when I was racing in America, and our races were always on the Saturday. Uh, like six, like seven fifty super sport and those ones. So like I'd go and win my race, and uh, Saturday night we'd be in the campsites just fucking yeah. <laughs> stealing yeah. all the beers, yeah, like yeah. stealing beers out of all the coolers from all the campsites, and just get all hammered on Saturday night. And uh, as yeah. the, as they're always that's a, like, <laughs> that's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's, I'm literally serious. go on. I, I used to I'm follow trying. a little bit of AMA. Yeah, and. <laughs> The, there was obviously like a lot of money in American yeah, superbikes huge. back back yeah. then. Was it? It's not as strong now, is it? No, because we not. found a lot. There was a lot of Brits that went over Hodgson went and had a go. Yeah. Didn't they? The, the Miguel Du Hamel era. Yeah, exactly. Aaron Yates, and that Maladin. was. I mean, we're talking like here's a comparison now. So back in those days, in my day and stuff like that, the superbike riders, uh, the average salary was between eight hundred thousand and two and a half million. Every wow. all of them, all of them were on no less. Like if you were a factory rider. That's right, you were yeah. on no less than 800,000 and most of them on a million plus like and I mean we're talking 12 plus riders and all I'm thinking is all, the taxes you know what I mean yeah. no, you, know, you know what I mean like it's like 800 grand it's like that's 400 it's still wow it, that yeah. is incredible so yeah I mean that's uh, and it, it was just insane and you know you go fast forward you know to even Tony Elias a few years back riding for the Yoshimura Suzuki just before they packed it in yeah hundred grand he was on yeah. and he was you know at the time multi you know uh ama champion on the same exact team that was paying two riders over two million uh a year because they uh spees and maladin were were both on over two million yeah. a year like 2.2 .2 and 2.5 because that was like the height of it wasn't it yeah maladin spees yeah eight cent key yeah exactly yeah, and yeah. so they uh they were they were making two plus million and, uh, and what year was, did the ass fall out of it completely? 2009. I'm glad you asked that. 2009. 2009. And so it never the, recovered. So the economy crashed, and so it's crazy because if you if in the model of it basically, because obviously in BSB, like BSB has obviously always been a, a competitive and and great championship and so forth, but there was never the money in BSB that there was over like there was in the AMA Moto yeah. America Championship, yeah. and that is purely because of the factory support. Every factory was involved then u.s factories had a lot of like clout and everything so u.s right. kawasaki was just the same as japanese kawasaki so it, what the money was really? coming through sponsors and corporate no, it, deals it, it was, was coming from coming manufacturers directly from the manufacturers wow. and that's what the the money was coming from and so which is why when the, the, the economy, economy crashed and then that was the problem like yeah. literally almost every bike manufacturer out there almost went bankrupt because they were churning out like you know hundreds products, of products, thousands products. millions of, of bikes every year of sport yeah. bikes yeah. and uh and then motorcycles literally just became uh, a luxury not yeah. a necessity and like instantly and the way that they were churning them out is they were like churning them out and push, putting them into factories and then they were just constantly being sold so even when the economy crashed yeah. That turning out of bikes kept happening, and yet they sold no bikes yeah, they in they America, were just stock and they just stocked up, yeah. and literally they almost went like bankrupt. And then, from that point forward, the support just started dribbling out, and like instantly they had they had no money to pay the riders, the teams, anything. And so what then happened was the private teams came in. Yeah. private guys came in and private owners and so forth came and then they went to the manufacturers and went oh if you just give us like this amount and then the, so the manufacturer they, oh yeah we'll give you the bikes yeah and then you know mm -hmm. and then so they started branding it and then the hospitalities and so forth and they started bringing in yeah. all the same exact look uh as what they were doing previous yeah and yet so they were getting all the same exposure all of this but literally, <laughs> literally. paying 20 30 million less yeah you know, they basically budget. adopted the UK yeah, the, the way version. that it's done over yeah, here. Yeah, exactly. Where, yeah, manufacturers they, put the bikes up, but then it's down to the teams yeah, to get the headline sponsors. Exactly. It? Yeah. And then and then that adapted, and then that happened, and then it just it never went back. And then obviously the manufacturers would be fucking insane to you know they'd be pretty yeah, of dumb. It's to, business, isn't it? They're it's, getting the exact same exposure and everything yeah. uh, as what they were previous, but at <laughs> almost nothing. Because yeah. even now the depth of field isn't what it was when yeah exactly when you guys and when Spies and yeah it but then about AMA. AMA. yeah, yeah but that just... also that also 
took in account because there was people from NASCAR actually took the championship over and deliberately ran it into the ground because they didn't want it Get being the popularity. Yeah, and they wanted obviously the more popularity to go to NASCAR and they literally drove it into the ground. Wow. Uh, in terms of they like canceled even TV contracts and everything. There went a few years where it wasn't even on like live television. Uh Proof that car drivers are bellies. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree, but uh, but they, so no, they uh, they literally just drove it into the ground, and then luckily, you know, over a couple of years later, then uh, Wayne Rainey and and uh, the other guy Chuck Asland, uh, who I know really well, took it over, and then obviously started kind of turning it back around, but. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, it just hasn't recovered ever what, since. Do, do, what, do, you reckon it, sorry. do you reckon it will ever recover? I, I don't know. I, I it's mean, not going to be an overnight job. They, it's going to no, take, no, 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 take a long they've time. They've done a good job over the last few years turning it around, and they have done like a great job in terms of what they've done from what it was and, and starting to turn it around. But what? now it's all changed because now they've got this bagger yeah. class racing which they, literally has three times the viewership yeah. of of uh the superbike class now more they, money in it way more money i mean the the, 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 bike the riders are making like they are by far the highest paid riders in really uh, on average in the what whole started like, out as a bit of fun America. and a bit of a yeah. concept class was it yeah. was you telling me how like how much is one of those bikes worth i think over almost, half million yeah, yeah. over half so, million so, 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 sorry teams. per bike yeah so they're putting in over a half million into the development and and into those bikes now it's insane like how the f but yeah. i think it's going to be really hard to get half a million to get a championship quick. back to the level that it was at when like you were talking about yeah, the, exactly. at the peak it's the the manufacturers know they don't need to go back to that now. No. The sponsors know they don't need to go back to that. Exactly. As but you say, the bag of things, it's good, and it's it, 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 it's yeah. and it can only go so far though, because I mean the the problem is now is they're actually transforming the bike so much that it literally, it, you know, soon's going to look like a super bike yeah. with these little boxes on the back, like, yeah. and then that you know that takes away all the, the the back yeah it takes away the fun of it it's what happens the with the evolution of these championships isn't it that's exactly what yeah. happens with them how, so how many people in it like from t 2009 onwards how many people in america are paying for rides because over here a lot my god it's it's what well, you've, you know, you'll have experienced well most most but in in no. in saying that i mean most do then they have somewhat adopted that but for the it's uh, I, it's crazy for as bad a state as the championship is in there's still riders probably on average making they're making more money there than here hmm. uh, which which that's that's that last which, thing is a lot of money in america baffles me yeah. like i mean it 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 is a shame and but you but you get more but yeah people are still paying for rides in certain extent but hmm. you get but more are being paid to ride than than uh, yeah it's it's no you like, i mean it's nowhere near as what it is here in bsb you i mean there are more way more people are paying for ryan in in you know all the other championships like spanish championship italian yep. championship i mean even us in grand prix now in moto 2 everyone everyone's paying for their ride to, yeah, yeah. to be there it's, like 70 percent of the field do, okay take out obviously you know we've talked about you know the financial implications that you know it, it needs money dragged in to make that work mm -hmm. take all that bullshit to the side for a second but do you agree that riders should have to pay? At this day, I no. no I you know what I mean. I, I don't think like anyone's going to think what's that interesting... riders should pay because no, no, I no, think but... any rider that's been there and put the the bollocks on the line. Yeah. And and, the... and it depends what level you're at. Like that, it, well... it depends what level you're at. Like, uh, but in this championship, I don't believe anyone from in BSB you refer to BSB I. and and mm. is and being the biggest and best domestic championship in the world and the viewership and the and the the money and the sponsors and everything behind it i don't think anyone should be paying anyone should be paying from even the smaller classes if like anyone at least from 600 super sport super stock super bike i don't think anybody should be i don't think any of the riders or anyone in the top 10 15 any one of those should be paying for their ride they should be pay, being paid it should, it's, then, a, it's a full-time occupation because to be at this level and yeah. that level and what they're doing 
it's a full time job. It is yeah. like, and and you have to put your life into it. You have to put the training into it. You have to put the time away from the track into it if you want to be at that level and be and to do that you and you know and like i said the amount of viewership and the the you know it, it's, entertainment behind it they should be being paid for for 100%. what it, it, they're doing but that's like the, the like the game we're in at the moment and it's it's horrible it's like did you did, again i know chris you got in touch with you, you know you like yeah, to try and get you on yeah. obviously you know times never matched up and but did you get to meet chrissy uh we not i didn't no, get no. to know him yeah like i never down, really I... got to know him and and as good as i but everyone i spoke to you know said he was a great bloke oh. a good guy and i i was looking forward to to actually really kind of getting to know him but like chrissy but, chrissy had his own like he ran he like a lot of people like gabriel and Cro like phil Krog, you know they like provided the bike but chrissy ran everything mm. ran his own like you're talking yeah. about dedicating your life into something yeah. chrissy ran everything even getting tickets him and grace ran around the whole place and they were pumping well over 10 grand a round yeah a round into it and it was a privateer and it's it it just i'm smiling thinking about it now and it's like arctic 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 this studio on the back of a vivaro yeah. <laughs> in the middle and he was scoring points and you just think how is this not getting like the skill set that chrissy had yeah. and the person he was you're thinking that just showed everything of how the sport is at the moment greatest sport in the world because we're all biased it's yeah. more by podcast but it's it just shows where we are at the moment within motorsport in general yeah and what annoys me on a personal level is you can almost buy a good ride you, you, you can't buy a good ride now yeah even if you're not like someone scouted you on the side on a motocross yeah. bike in the middle of california and it was just that sheer skill set that went we need to get you on a bike yeah and then that cream naturally like you know, cream yeah. rises to the top. It always exactly. does. And it does. And it's almost like if you're getting paid, it almost gets thinned out even more. And you almost like if you can pay for a good bike and you're on a shitter bike, but you've got more skill set. It, that's yeah, where we and are. Then, and, it's like, and then you get hey. that motivation. You get the you get the younger kids if they know, like, you know, that was the biggest thing, like in America as well, like at that age, because you everyone knew like that they those guys were getting paid millions of dollars and you know they were rock, rocking up in their you know fucking ferraris and their you know whatever That's so cool lamborghinis and cars like that and you're like fuck you know i want yeah. that some like, time for yeah, yeah and that just you know it only drives you even more and more and more and yeah. then just like any other sport like you know kids here in football in you know european soccer football and and you know, same in America, American football and baseball and stuff like that. That's why you get the millions of kids and the only like best elite like ever making it to that yeah. point. Like you said, the cream rises to the top and you only get that aspiration and that that motivation from, a, you know, children at a young age to do that when yeah. they're, you know, they know they can make an, an amazing living at and, it. And they do know from the word go like those yeah. NFL players are on telephone yeah. numbers aren't they They're yeah on exactly ridiculous money to play yeah. American football I mean, and, and the kids know that don't they from yeah, being four from, or five they're like yeah this exactly. dude's a gazillionaire yeah and they football. know that and that and it just and it that's where you get like the the best of the best of the best and like I mean it's I'm and I'm, I'm I'm conflicted on it but like I've always said it like I, I mean there there has to come a point in time now because the, I've just seen it drain and drain and drain and drain and drain and and literally like the, the the only people that are literally making anything remotely close to the same money that they used to back like you know back in my era and, and even way before in the 90s and 80s and so forth is is literally the top 10 in MotoGP like yeah. top five is the only ones on those same like similar yeah. kind of numbers and that is it because like, there's still riders the in world. MotoGP paying for yeah for exactly seats, yeah. That's yeah. Mental, oh, which is nuts it's, it's just to qualify on a MotoGP grid <laughs> and be within that time you should be getting paid yeah like and you are at the pinnacle wild. of motorsport same in F1 though isn't it yeah you know, the, exactly the they're all like F1. paying for drives yeah. and that's what like I mean that. that's 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 what I mean you know you get a billionaire going I want my son in that and it's like well arguably in the in the sense of skill put like passion and drive you shouldn't have that seat it's just like no, i want to have a crack at it but the oh, amount it's of difficult. money that it's the manufacturers make and and the money that they have i th i believe like and I've, I've said it and I, like i said i'm conflicted because obviously like being on the management side of the team and stuff now like i understand and then obviously like seeing it firsthand riding with the motor rapido team here like i only knew they were a smaller team and 
you know, I saw the effort and the amount of like money and stuff that they would put out of their pocket just for us to be at every race weekend. So I understand that side of it. It makes it that much more difficult. But that's where the manufacturers need to step in. Yeah. And I yeah. and I said it from like for years now, I've said it like there needs to be almost a boycott from from the racers. Like they literally they did it in American baseball. So they did this in American baseball and uh, all of the pro players because you know, you've got hundreds and hundreds of players and their schedule in American baseball, as much as I hate the sport, like <laughs> they they do, they are busy. Like they do a hell of a lot of rounds and they literally have hundreds of players on each, like on the teams that, you know, don't play and they're reserve players and yet they still have to go to every single round. They have to go to every training session. They have to fly to every, and, you Just know. Just to sit on the bench. And then they sit on the bench, but the problem is, is they're away from their family. And yet yeah, back I, in the day, those players weren't getting paid and they were getting paid next to nothing. Right. And yet they still had to go and were had to attend every round and do all of the stuff and all the games and everything. So they couldn't even provide for their own families. So it took the entire baseball community to do it, but they did it and they they finally got a boycott and we're talking the ones that were taking hundreds of millions and so forth they even got involved and said like look this isn't fair they have to though don't they, they it doesn't work yeah because if what if if, if, if you're one, not unified yeah it it's a waste work. of time isn't it but they, they need a, almost they a all got union, together don't they? and they took it away and they 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 did a boycott and then major league baseball went you know what fucking like we're we're bigger than them you know we'll we'll carry on and so they tried. They brought in replacement players from, you know, like university, like old retired players, and just anyone. They brought in anyone that could play. No one watched the games. That was it. Like the, the viewership went Brilliant. because people wanted to see their heroes and the ones they aspire and look up to yeah. on the field, not some Joe Blow, you know, yeah. whoever. And so that, and they, they did. They ended up working a deal with the players. And from that point forward, no one, no one on the grid could make, or no one on the field, or if you were signed to a professional team, yeah. you could make no less than a hundred thousand, and then yet the play, you know, the others could make in however much they wanted. But no one signed to a professional baseball team from that point forward could be paid less Brilliant. than a hundred thousand, and then insurance and you know medical insurance and all yeah. the the rest of it. And like, I've said it from day one, but like there needs to ha be something happen like that yeah. especially in like this championship and they they you know because the oh, as big as the sport is here in the uk like and the manufacturers and i know how little the support the manufacturers put yeah, into yeah. this championship yeah. And like, I, I think every team needs to do a, a full blown absolute boycott and, and be at, with the championship involved and just say, look, until like we actually start getting the support that we deserve, all bikes should be blacked out and no manufacturer should even be oh. like listed onto yeah. the side of the bike. Yeah. But it shouldn't even stop there though. You know, yeah. people are buying bikes, you know, yeah. people are buying sports bikes. It's like, well, actually, you know, people go buy a sports bike because they see it racing. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? It's actually, if we stop buying, they'll see the profits go down again. Ah, why are they doing this? Yeah. This is the reason why. We're starting to coup, gentlemen. Were you, loving it. Were you, and you, uh, I hope it's not an inappropriate question, but when you were racing in the British Championship, was there prize money then or not? No, no, no. no, there, no, so there, that no was there, there was no, not, there was there no was prize no, money. There was no like prize money here. No, I mean, no. the team got, I think the team did get prize money and stuff like that, but like, no, we. I never got any. Because like, that always money. blows my mind. Those boys that have just been going around there yeah. in the pissing rain around Brands GP. You know, risking the put, life. Yeah, and, absolutely. You know, putting putting it on the show the on, and they yes, they're getting the basic, but they don't get prize money. No, it blows mm. my mind that every time. And that's time. it's just basically contract. Like it's. I mean, some riders have bonuses. I always had bonuses in my contract for podium and you know finishes like that. But like. The fact that the championship doesn't put up like prize money is is quite shocking to me. And, and but it's 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 always going to be a difficult thing because the one thing we're always going to get preyed on is the passion, isn't it? We want to race bikes. Yeah, that's a that's, problem. That's, and you know what I mean. We all want to be champion, and we yeah, all were like. But that's uh, where the uh, backbone comes but, into it of saying, do you know what, though, guys? We all do it together. We all do. You know, none of us are turning up to the next round. We all stay at home, and we all agreed on that. But that's the difficult and, thing. And, and it's uh, hard, isn't it? But, but until it gets exercise, you're not going to. But then know. you're. But it's so hard because you're going to get the motorcycle race. You know, you're going to have get that finite four or five in the championship that are all making. You know. 
the money. Decent, yeah, make decent, decent yeah. money yeah. Yeah. that have worked and gone through all that period of not making any money, especially yeah, in yeah. this championship, yeah, that yeah. gone through all those years and hardship of paying for rides and all of that. So they're like, fuck, no, I ain't going to jeopardize this. Like, yeah, and, yeah, that's, and that's the thing, isn't it? And they're, that's why it's just going to be so difficult to ever get everyone on board to do yeah, something yeah. like that. But I mean, it, I believe it should happen because like, it, and at the end of the day, it's, and that's not on the team. It's not on the championship. No, no. It's no, not, no. It, it's on the manufacturers. The manufacturers yep. do need to step up. Like, I mean, it's, it just baffles me at like, you're going to be in a boardroom in about <laughs> two weeks' time with all that, those BSB boys looking at you going, right, how do we do this then, John? Yeah, <laughs> you right, with a whiteboard right. and a pointer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a way to do it. Go, let, let's go, I was about to say, I, I want to go, go back. Let's go, go back, back to, like, like, you know, truck truck and John, you know what I mean? You, you're racing, you know, and it's just think, was that just the forward momentum? And, 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 like, let's just carry on that story. Let's carry on that. I'm in a good place. Unfortunately, got taxed to a living hilt. You know what yeah. I mean? You had all this money back. What was the next part of that story for you then? What was the next stage? So basically, <laughs> I, I won two championships back to back in America. I won the, the 750 Super Sport Championship that first year. And then I won the uh, Formula Extreme Championship uh, the following year. And I, and I was also racing 600 Super Sport that second year, which was cool because... 600 super sport back in my day as well like that was the other thing in america so if you were an american superbike rider you also apart from the only one that i know was uh i think it was uh matt maladin just because he he was multi champion at the time did he win like eight or nine or something yeah yeah i don't know it was like six six plus i don't know how many i had but he was the only rider uh, apart from maybe one other, but if you raced American Superbike, you had to race 600 Super Sport. I think that's mega. I think so that's that brilliant. you you had to do both in the same weekend, and and on the same day. Like you had, if you raced Superbike, you also you know, and were with the factory team, you also had to race 600 Super that's Sport. That's It's like very TT in it. Yeah. But it was a super cool class for me because I obviously got to race against all of the the factory superbike riders within 600 super sport like it was a, yeah, a yeah. stacked class so that was a, a good year for me to, to obviously progress and I did quite well like I, I I'm not sure I don't I think I did I think I may have gone on the podium once twice that year but I was I was always up in the battle towards the front and riding with the factory guys but um, I then because of the relationship I uh, the team owner at the time, John Ulrich, he had a very close relationship with the guy Peter Clifford, who owned the Red or was team owner manager of the Red Bull Yamaha team in in MotoGP. And so, I'd went over and like they they had me like test the bike when I was like 17, and I rode it first time in uh, in Bruno, and it was crazy. I was like, oh, no, I was I was yeah 16. Yeah, 16, 17, I'm and I rode a... I'm just thinking, if you got a boner on an RS125, yeah. what was, was it like it? on a, yeah. <laughs> on a 500 Grand Prix bike? No, but I was literally... Where did that dude in the tank come from, uh, no, John? I was, I was literally shitting myself, like, because I, I, I was on track with all of the Grand Prix riders uh, at the time because it was a Monday test at the right after the Grand Prix, uh, like, because a lot of the GP teams, all then they we, we still do it, like, today, they ended up testing on the Monday, right after the Grand Prix. So I went there for the Grand Prix and then obviously tested on the Monday. And so I was on track with all the other then, you know. Who was who was in there then? That, Biagi, like, yeah, Biagi, Barros, uh, Barros uh, Cheka. Cheka, Kenny Roberts, uh, Junior, yeah. and, yeah. and and, and uh, I, I think it was, was Mick riding that? I don't know, I think he had just uh, like Crebier and all Gary of those McCoy? guys. Yeah, there? Gary McCoy was and all of Jesus those guys. Jesus, and, uh, oh, okay. and Tetsuya, Har Tetsuya like Harada and Norik Abe and all of those guys. But uh, it was funny. I I was like, fuck. I, I, and I, I didn't want to high side the thing. But I ended Constantly up going... they're called the high siders. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> you talk, yeah, I don't want to high side. It's pretty obvious. But... Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, and I mean, I was only like 16, and so I went out and rode, and I, I ended up fucking, I, I was quite nervous, and like, I ended up getting into, it was Tetsuya Harada, like, came around, and it was one, it was like, fucking first of like, I don't know, two or three laps, and like, I ended up like, getting in the way of Tetsuya Harada, and he like, came by, and was like, fucking <laughs> waving his hands at me, I'm like, sorry, fuck, like, and, but I ended up going like, decent and quite well, that, and only did like, one day, it was kind of like, I thought it was 
kind of like a thank you from my team manager, like because of the relationship. I thought it was kind of more of a thank you yeah. uh, for winning the championship the, the previous year. And uh, and what it was is basically kind of a test. A bit of a because, scout. Yeah, a bit of a scout. Yeah. And, uh, and then I did a couple more that year. But um, so at the end of that year, uh, I'd won another championship again, two for Suzuki back to back. And then, uh, you know, the ultimate, like the, the next step, would be from that point to go to uh would be to go to superbike and so what i did uh was i intended to go to to ama superbike from that point but the only i love suzuki suzuki were my favorite manufacturer i only wanted to ride for yoshimura suzuki and uh i literally had a contract on the table for uh every single superbike team and manufacturer for the following season except Yoshimura Suzuki because at the time there was the guy uh, that ran Yoshimura Suzuki his name was Mal Harris who's this fat kind of just uh, like <laughs> disgusting <laughs> guy that just yeah but and he just oh, he pissed me off but uh he didn't like me because I had the earrings, I had the tattoos, and like I was, you know, little had like the little yeah, bit yeah. of the bad boy image at the at the young age. And he wanted the straight laced call. Yeah, and he yeah. didn't he didn't like me, so so uh, you, so wow. I I it was because of that reason that I just I said fuck you and I'm uh, fuck it I'll go to Grand Prix like I'm gonna do it. So and they offered you the the Grand Prix ride came at the same time then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So and then that that offer was on the table, but I was wow. literally gonna turn it down to go to Superbike to do that next level. Yeah. Uh, even though I was up in the air, I I probably would have chosen the, the Yoshimura Suzuki deal if if the, it was if it on was the that. table, but it wasn't. So I just said fuck it, I'll go. I will. I'll go to Grand Prix and. Is that, uh, is that quite an off. angry decision as well? It's like, I can't believe I've been haven't been offered. I'm off. Yeah, it's quite. You know, yeah, the, the and that, and quite that there, was, isn't yeah, it? You know what I mean? That was like, my rebellious side. Like that was my rebellious side. That you said, you know what? Fuck it. I will do it. Like yeah. I can do it. And fuck you. So then. I'm gonna do it. And, <laughs> and then so anyone who signs him in the future, even in the manager <laughs> role, can, don't send him anything. Why? Don't send him anything. <laughs> Knocking on the door. Right. Yeah. <laughs> So that was my like, yeah, that was my rebellious side, and I did it, and I, I, can, you know, gave it everything, and uh, ended up being quite a successful year. I mean, I, I, you know, ended up doing quite well that year. I, I, two uh, thousand and when two thousand two, so 2002, it was the final yeah, yeah. year, and it was it was a shame, but it was like the highlight of like my entire career because I always grew up like once. You know, I got that boner on the RS. Like, <laughs> I started watching road racing Grand Prix a hell of a lot more. Like, I just started then. Always, I kind of switched my yeah, yeah my motivation and and dreams to be in a Grand Prix star. And obviously, watching Schwantz and you know Rainey and all of uh you know the Grand Prix stars of that time. And uh, and then so you know and and the sound and the like just fucking how hard everything were they to about ride? the super hard yeah. like they well, were the early ones that doing in Schwantz Road they were called doing rideables weren't yeah. they was, would you still class that as the yeah uh, that 100%. was definitely like, they didn't they refine they were, it they were just a, and I, I think my motocross experience oh, really kind of helped with it like with adapting to it and well, coming out the seat every two seconds yeah ago. out of the seat and the power band and the way that it was like I mean it it was a fucking beast monster of a bike like to to try and, and i had some fucking massive, massive high sides, sides that year. like <laughs> yeah. massive fucking yeah. and multiple is that it, year would you rather hop on a modern motor gp bike now compared to that i i i just to yeah, see what the technology is but i mean it's it's a hard one i i but I, there's still, I, even if I did, I, I, it was just for the curiosity of yeah, just yeah. to feel what the modern MotoGP bike was like, but like, I, it still wouldn't take away that, that two, like a 500 two stroke are still my ultimate, like yeah. idol of a bike. It's the mo like, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what generation you are. That's a man's bike. Oh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It doesn't matter if you had a 1200 or a jet engine. It's like 500. Every bloke in the world goes like this. 
good lad. But the, yeah. other, the other thing is the smell and the passion. Yeah, like, the I smell live and the sound and that. the power band and that just that smell of the of the of yeah. the oil and the mixture and that the noise as well. Five hundred ring, just wang ding. Yeah, and you got, and you got a power band pop sound. On them. Oh, a bloke with a box of needles for the carbs. Yeah, <laughs> right, son, half a jet going. Even son. even kids now though yeah. that don't understand. It's like, no. why does that smell nice, daddy? Like, yeah, because that's exactly. a proper motorbike. Yeah, because that's we're not allowed to make them anymore because there's someone hugging trees somewhere. Apparently, where the ones causing the problem but that's a proper motor <laughs> yeah 100 yeah. yeah, no. like oh bring it's back. amazing bring back but two strokes it was good yeah oh, fuck. it was yeah it was oh yeah and just that, to be able to race that and and it was a bike that not everyone could ride like oh. there were multiple people that came from other championships and superbike and world superbike you know throughout all the years like had come over and and you know were expected to do extremely well on the grand prix and they just couldn't do it they 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 just do you think that's because it was a two-stroke just yeah, because just of the, the, what it was of everything about it like yeah. in the way and the technique and and you know it was it it was it's a different beast to any other bike that i've ever ridden in my life like it, it had to be ridden and finessed and yet fucking manhandled but finessed and it, it was a it was a, a crazy bike it was like sure. having a really pretty Russian bird yeah that's you know, right. just constantly <laughs> keeping her happy just in case she does decide just to fucking shoot you yeah exactly yeah. exactly we don't really understand her but yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> looks mega though yeah <laughs> but you're always a little bit nervous yeah, around her yeah a little bit nervous around her <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's the KGV coming to my house then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Easy. But like, you know, at this point, you know, before you got on that bike, the five hundred, did you like? I refer to them as slaps. We've all had them as motorcycle races, like big, big crashes, and you just know when you're up in the air, the second you land, it's gonna hurt. Yeah. You know, did you have many big slaps throughout your career before getting on a bike that is guaranteed to give I you had, a slap? Yeah, I had a few, yeah, a few, yeah. few big high sides, but I mean biggest one fast forward like in a few years like speaking about that you literally like just brought it all back in vision into my head like Sorry. And, and the thought <laughs> but i had a bad one i i uh because you know back in my day as well the the, the medical uh, attention that you received uh, was way different to you know what it is Can today yeah. but uh i ended up having a crash in saxon ring germany uh i think it was like oh four five oh five uh, ended up having a big crash on the friday had a huge high side um i ended up crashing so i broke my left ankle broke my broke my ankle uh ended up i i fucking shattered all my teeth out so all my feet teeth are fake because i i broke all my i slid through the had a huge high side ended up breaking my ankle oh yeah i broke uh, i broke three ribs that was it i i fractured three ribs and i was like fuck it i'm still gonna race on on With sunday knee teeth. and uh, yeah thing no makes teeth. Me cringe, i know because no, 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 i no. went backwards i slid backwards uh through the feet first into the gravel trap and like my helmet was like a scoop and all the little rocks just Jesus. and just shattered all my teeth out and i had like broken teeth like half teeth like it was just oh it was horrendous and like i've always been quite funny with teeth like because did you have any exposed nerves because yeah I had, it was I so painful a, i crashed so a bmx painful. as a kid and i went over the bars and i had braces on yeah and my face the first thing that hit the curb the corner of the curb was my mouth yeah and it, it knocked all my that's why my teeth are trash because they couldn't finish yeah. doing the braces and the wire came through my lips was, and i had exposed nerves yeah. and as soon oh, as you said teeth, so then it's painful. like it's so a, so painful do I? Did you do you wear a gum shield before you raced? I that, but that was because after that I did. Yeah. So from that point forward, I put a gum, a gum shield, shield in. Five, yeah, I, I had a gum shield because the only rider I've ever seen with a gum shield in. Yeah. So Is I that... always from that point. Plus this fucking cost me forty over forty thousand dollars. So I, I was like, there's no way I'm doing that shit again. So, so I was like, fuck that. I'm not, I'm not paying that again so ever since then that that and I, I i still have the same i wore the same gun shield like my entire fucking career for the next 15 years like with the same gum shield but um uh oh. it was crazy so i did that on the friday and uh i rode the bare minimum on the saturday and i was like fucking still in, like in quite a bit of pain 
And then Sunday morning, I was like, fuck it. Like the, you know, at the time back then you could get cortisone shots, which literally mm -hmm. like numbed you like, and, and you didn't feel any pain. So I was like, fuck it, I'll race. Like, you know, I, I felt like I could still do quite well in the race. So uh, I had cortisone <laughs> shots all in my legs. So uh, anyways, biggest problem, I couldn't feel my foot. Like I didn't know I'd never had them before at that point prior. So yeah, I literally just could not. I do, I just thought it took away the pain and you know would help that out. And but that's your bit, bit left, of a nerve left, block. Left, so shifted, that's your left. So shift, shift shifted gear. Yeah, gear, yeah. And I just couldn't feel it whatsoever, and got off to a decent start. And like my ribs still hurt like hell, but I I was always quite good in my life. Like adrenaline was Fixes. always good at taking away all my pain like instantly. And uh, and so I got off and actually had like a good start to the race going. I was fighting with my teammate doing quite well and uh fucking at Saxon I come out of turn one it's real tight like you know fucking I don't know it's first second you go first second gear and then the, it's a fully cranked over uh full lean angle uh second gear wide open like on the limiter you bop 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 on the limiter and uh and I was on the limiter second gear couldn't feel my foot obviously and for fucking I just ended up like dropping onto the shifter so full lean angle Whoa. on the limiter and shifted into third at fucking full lean angle and it just went whoosh, sent me sideways and fucking flicked me. It's all on YouTube. Like there's Is that, it's, that upside down? Yeah, and I do a full front flip in the air. But what fucking most people don't know is I literally have three fucking broken Bus ribs. Like three uh, broken ribs from Friday and a broken ankle and, and fucking no teeth. No teeth. Oh. And I'm literally flipping through the air. Was it one of those like, where you were in the air and, and you I had was time like, to I think? Was, yeah, the whole time. Yeah. It was the slowest fucking crash of my life. And I'm like praying to pass out. Like, I'm <laughs> praying, just fucking please, like, pass out, pass out, pass out. And then, and like, it's, and I, I swear everything went through my head. Like, while I was flipping, I was like, fucking hell, I've already got fractured ribs. One of them's going to go straight through my lungs. Like, yeah. I knew how hard the impact was going to be. And like I was thinking of this the How entire time I was flipping. think of so much stuff. Yeah, in, in a split a second. second. Yeah, and uh, and it didn't. I obviously didn't pass out, and I just landed, and all the air out of me just like, and so I I land, and I'm so stiff because I can't breathe, and like I couldn't breathe for like a good one two minutes. I was like, uh, 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 like just I can. Oh, it was uh, horrendous. But and uh yeah that was that was and that was a, a bad night because it was that night uh as well i, I was at the hotel I was, and I'd, I'd been away in europe like i had done all the previous years i'd been in europe for the whole year and like that was the start of our summer break and uh, i was obviously on my way and flying home the next day and my sister called me that night uh to tell me my dog of 15 years like who was oh, my no. like pitbull winston ended up passing away uh that night so i was like that was like and then there's certain cases like that throughout my whole life like when it rains it fucking yeah. pours you were like, fed a full shit sandwich yeah the whole lot, like yeah. yeah when when it rains it fucking pours yeah. like and there's been a lot of instances like that in my life you know the mad thing like you know if you're not a dog owner or you know a pet owner you don't realize when you're absolutely banged up to the living hilt you do want to go home and see your dog yeah you do you know what i mean yeah, and you yeah. just want to go home like and just scan where's my dog yeah and people mate, don't i couldn't people I don't, could don't imagine understand that no i don't and you just say, I'm, no oh, I, I mean i loved i mean i've always been a dog lover when we've had him my whole lives and like i've even got my my latest one tattooed on me on my on my chest like on my on my rib cage here like my little nugget but uh yeah i'm always I'm, i mean they are family like they they're, are, they're yeah. literally family 100%. like they your are 100 percent family you up and told you you lost your job yeah that, uh, after all of that and i was like i i i was I do you wish you'd waited until you got home or do you, are you glad she told yeah. you there and then no Ooh, good question. Yeah, would you have rather known or not oh good question that's a very I don't good know. question now. like mm. i what she just, I, yeah, uh, I don't know. What about I, you? If you went, if you were lying oh, there, right. like John, would you? What would? What but would I'll that tell you what, you? I got fucking wasted. That yeah, night. I got absolutely fucking I, I, obliterated. I'm like, emotionally retarded until it comes to dogs. Honestly, yeah. genuinely, I can sit on Instagram and go through horrific things. Some, whether it's good or bad, if yeah. it's got a dog in it, 
fuck, I'm gone. I'm, but you know, yeah, just yeah, do- yeah. dogs. I don't know why dogs just sit in there. Yeah, me, I, so. love, I love dogs, uh, and know. they and they've always, I've, you know, they have always been really good with dogs, and they've been good with me. It's uh, well, apart from one fucking experience, I was talking about this just recently. Like I, I had these dogs in my neighborhood, and I've always like loved dogs, and and you know, I never did anything to ever hurt like animals but uh but apart from one time in that as well but uh like I've, I've, you know i love every I, I can't even kill like fucking even though i go on a motorcycle i kill millions of them but uh i don't even kill insects like i can't nah. i can't yeah, yeah, yeah. Like fly out the window you'd rather like, fuck out the I, bees flies yeah. anything like anything i will always like give even it a chance spiders out. even like fucking the black widows and deadly spiders and yeah. things that we get in america like if i have one in the house i'll trap it get it and i'll release it outside like whether that's a fl- any insect yeah, yeah. even mosquitoes like i fucking do that like I draw the but, line of mosquitoes. Yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> kill them fuckers. Yeah, <laughs> I, trust me. When they when they, well, if they bite me, I'll, I'll say fuck it. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. they, <laughs> the rules got bite me, I'm like fuck it. Like you, you chose to bite me. <laughs> bite my. You fingertip. started it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, but no, I I I had a funny instance with the dogs. So like they were the. Like, I don't even know what they are. They're like the brown. They're like almost like Dobermans. Like they're big dogs and the brown with like whitish gray spots. Um, I don't even Ooh. know what the type they are. They're like, but they're kind of like Dobermans. Bigger, real skinny, lean dogs, but they're fucking what, big. Like, no, 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 no. Like fine no. yeah. They're They're like quite, quite like skinnier dogs they're not like a rottweiler but they're like they're like brown short-haired dogs with like white spots i'll have to look up oh, we'll have to have a look at that later on we'll get they're, they're to try quite and big and they're, they're they've got fucking floppy ears teeth, or pointy ears like pointy ear pointy ears mm, and they're like they're quite big and they've got sharp teeth big noses yeah and uh and they look like quite vicious dogs but um anyways so they're, they're from the doberman family but uh, anyways, there used to be these like two dogs that, that were in the, the end of my street and they were always in their like chain link fence. But like every fucking day I rode my bicycle around the neighborhood and I'd ride out. They'd always attack the fence and rah, 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 fucking bark at me like crazy. And so, you know, I started to antagonizing them a little bit. Like I would, <laughs> I would walk by and like I'd be like and I'd like fucking, you know, yell in their face or say something or just, you know do stupid shit like that i was being just a dumb little kid and uh anyways i went there was riding by one day and they came by and like i went over to just go and antagonize them even more and like piss them off go over i look and fucking the gates open the gates fucking left wide open for the first time ever that I've ever seen it. And at this point, John knew. He <laughs> and, fucked I, up. <laughs> and I'm like, fuck. And so like I fucking started to like pedal. Never pedaled so hard in my life. And I fucking came up and he fucking bit me right on the like side of my thigh. <sighs> and like, oh, it drew like massive blood. Like it was, oh, it was a fucking bad bite as well. And uh, you know, I was a fucking cheeky little shit so i deserved it so <laughs> that's that's i wouldn't i wouldn't if the dogs ever just sat there and they remember that time the gate was over that was min crack that yeah but no <laughs> they, my I, my my mum and dad were actually like quite really pissed off about it and like mm. we that but they never did anything like and we never did anything about it just for fear of you know because because dogs can get put down yeah, for that and yeah. that and yeah. You know, even I at that age was the last thing I ever wanted. So we never like, mm. you know, complained about it or went to like my, my dad had a bit of a go at the for leaving the gate open. But I always surprised you how fast a dog can run. Doesn't yeah, it? exactly. You think you're quick. Oh, and then oh, oh, pulls the fucking... pin and you're like, oh, my God. It's over. Yeah. yeah. It's over yeah, at that point. I couldn't point. outrun that. But uh, yeah. But ever since then, like I said, I, I, my, I was a fucking scary experience but uh a, a, again a teaching moment a little like bit of a learning, warning shot yeah. Yeah. learning. Yeah, love it. but yeah i love dogs always did but yeah that was a fucking that was a rough year but going back we'll switch back i wanted to, to tell you this story as well the in the grand prix so i obviously when i made the decision to go to grand prix and go to moto gp and everything fucking i had zero support from the american like superbike riders like everyone like apart from doug chandler who had done it he was like oh like he's a good rider and i raced a lot with him in the 600 super sport class he was quite supportive and like yeah like he can do well blah 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 biggest one was fucking matt maladin 
like he absolutely fucking like just slated me in the press saying how like big of a joke I was going to be I was going to be shit I was going to be terrible like I was jealousy gonna, I was gonna so make, it's just bad apples that, I was going to make a fucking yeah. fool of myself and like the American writers and all this shit and uh, and I you know obviously I I fucking didn't know much about his early career but he had done the same thing he had went I guess to Grand Prix quite young at his age at you know 18 or 19 or whatever and did shit fucking terrible so he had went and gone terrible and obviously you know he was sure that I was going to do exactly the uh, same I'm as pro- him probably and hoping shit. you were going to do yeah, the same yeah, yeah. no and he was he was, he was hoping he was. that I was that I was going to be shit and uh, and so that just even gave me even even and it was good I wanted that like that gave me a chip on my shoulder to even you know go out and succeed more like that just gave me That's that drive to you know what say fuck you and common and thing throughout your career it is, isn't it? And, you know what uh, I mean that rebellion like yeah, get fucking like that's yeah, brilliant I always though. had a like chip on my shoulder yeah, good. and uh, and so they uh, anyway fast forward at the end of the year I ended up doing well enough unfortunately Red Bull Yamaha uh, were closing down at the end of that year I had to find another ride uh, and what then, age were you at this like when you were nine, eight, I was 17 going on 18 so 18 to 19 yeah, so yeah. 18 to 19 Not even a drinking old. age. You're yeah. jumping from team to team, still professional, doing all this yeah. is class. Carry on, sorry. Yeah, Red yeah, Bull. so 18 to 19. And uh, and obviously, so I had to find a new ride in Grand Prix. And I obviously went and did well enough to that teams notice me. And uh, and it was fucking awesome because I and I got the opportunity. I had a, I had a few actual opportunities from Yamaha, from what, like a, a satellite Honda team. A factory Suzuki came to me and uh, and offered me a contract to sign with their MotoGP team, and like fucking to be able to do that because Suzuki was always my like favorite yeah. bike growing up and like my best manufacturer that I always wanted to ride for, so to be able to just fucking instantly like just leapfrog the American Suzuki, fucking Mel Harris, <sighs> Matt Maladin, and all of those guys was just so fucking awesome. And just what, give what him it, the bird. Yeah. What made it even better. That's what this episode would be called, the bird. (laughs) We were were at the first ever uh, uh, test in Malaysia. So I I rode it for the first time in Malaysia. At the start of the year, we were at a preseason test at the Malaysia track. And so we're riding, and it ended up being a full Suzuki test. So Suzuki had actually hired the track, and then they brought all of their, and it was something they did quite regularly back then, but they brought all of their Suzuki riders that were factory supported from all the different championships from, you know, American Suzuki, World Superbike, uh, British Endurance Championship. I think maybe uh, they, they, it wasn't fully factory supported at that time. So the right. British weren't, but they did their World Endurance, like their Suzuka team, yeah. the World Superbike and the American Superbike. And uh, and so obviously I was out on track with, with and I, I built up a good friendship at that time with Speed. So it was good, like, having him over and and you know spending him you know riding with him but it was so fucking cool because it worked out almost perfect uh turn three at malaysia is basically like you go from like second to like fifth gear throughout the entire turn three and you're fucking you oh. just light the fuck up out of the rear tire like all the way through there and uh, it was like the second, second or third, second, second day. It was on the second day, towards the end of the second day. I could see him ahead of me, and it worked out perfect. I was catching up to Maladin, and uh, and I had caught him, and it worked out perfectly that where I passed him was right uh, into tur- like coming on like midway through turn three. So I went around the outside of him, in this like fourth gear, like Spinning. wide open with smoke pouring out of the back and passed him and just fucking instantly <laughs> put my finger in the air and flipped him off as I passed him with smoke just pouring out of the back. That was like, just like the most gratifying, like, you know, biggest fuck you moment. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, like that was just such a great feeling to be that able to amazing. do that. And the coolest thing about it as well is they actually gave him as a present uh, for winning the championship that previous year, uh, they gave him the whole day on the on the GSBR uh, MotoGP bike the following day, 
and he didn't get fucking remote. No, and no. I was on it for the first time in my life, like the that weekend. So that was your first got, time on the four stroke. On the yeah, four on the four stroke as well. Motor four GP stroke bike. MotoGP yeah, yeah. bike. Whoa. And like I absolutely fucking obliterated his lap times. So Perfect. like it was just yeah, it was, yeah. that was uh, sometimes it's nice to let your talking happen on the track. Yeah, it? exactly. You, know, you don't so get drawn was, in, just stick a result in there, yeah. Yeah. So that was a that was a good like moment. But uh, That's also the point that usually as you do that you do too much of that and then give yourself a yeah, massive, massive eyesight, eyesight and then you have to go back to the team and explain yeah. what happened but well. I, I did that <laughs> i did that one year in phillip island we were testing and we were testing at phillip island and uh it was like because you come out of the second to last turn which is like a really quite tight opening up left hander and then it like you just carry on turning into pit lane yeah and uh and i came out of there one lap and i was like i was on an in lap and like there were like loads of people on the track at the four stroke because you could just spin them and you left the coolest fucking like black line darkies like that you could ever see like on those things back then. And uh, and I wanted to leave one all the way into pit lane. <laughs> that was my intention. Like I wanted to leave like because there were a few that got close, but I wanted to leave one all the way, right, in, the way in to the pit lane. Yeah. And nearly was, to the 60 that, bar yeah <laughs> and that was like my intention and uh and it went horribly wrong it ended up like going way too far to the point of no return ended up having a massive fucking high side and then uh and then the team came in and like i i, I was gonna blag it and say like oh yeah it was a fucking high side and then they obviously knew on the data, like, and, and exactly. Why were you full throttle in second gear? Yeah, if you were coming exactly. To the pitch, so yeah. there was not, I tried to blag it at first. And then the crew chief came to me and said, mm, this looks a bit strange. And then I had to come clean and tell them. Like, are they all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, what was right. it? yeah, yeah, yeah they were all right. They've got to know, right, we've got lads here, the motorbike races. There's a little bit of a screw just slightly loose. And yeah, some, of the mapping, some of the mapping's not quite right. They're going to do crazy things yeah, now and again. But they, and they, they, yeah, I mean, they, at the time, they knew who they were dealing with at the yeah. time. You could not get away I'd already with that been on like loads of trouble and things and fines and so I mean they knew who they were dealing with. So I mean they they weren't happy about it, but I mean there were no like repercussions or anything. What how many years did you do with uh, with that Suzuki squad? Was it three three years? No, or two years? no, no, no. I Before was Kawasaki. With Suzuki. Yeah, I was with them uh three, four, five, six, seven, five, five, five years. years with the Suzuki Moto GP. Hell. Right, so that was ep part one, episode one. We're not sure how we're going to do this because it's the actual first time on Chase and the Racing that we've separated up a programme. So that was nearly collectively four hours of John Hopkins. So we've come to the decision, me and Grace, we've come to the decision that we're going to break it up in part, like two parts even. So the next one is coming out very, very soon in the next couple of weeks or a week. You can tell I'm <laughs> we're still trying to figure this out while I'm talking to you a lot. And um, leading into this episode, we're going to obviously finish off the program, which I'm really looking forward for everyone to listen to. But by all means, please leave some comments at the bottom of the YouTube element. Become a patron, get your feedback more direct in between the episodes of how you thought us separating this has gone down. It's all an experiment, but I'm really looking forward to you all listening to the second part of this episode. It is, it just gets better and better like a glass of wine, but hey, please leave a comment, hit like, hit subscribe, do what you have to do. That would be fantastic and we'll catch up with you soon. See you in a bit, guys. Chasing the Racing, powered by Colchester Kawasaki, part of the Global Moto Group. We supply new Aprilla, Moto Guzzi, Vespa, Royal Enfield, Kawasaki, Sim, Mutt and Benelli motorcycles.